Please welcome Drs. Besser and Fisher. Thank you for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here with this um, esteemed group of speakers. It is customary at the time of significant transition at an institution to reflect back on the beginnings of that institution, on the accomplishment of the founders, and on the progress that has been made following their pioneering work. On this occasion of the inauguration of a new president of the institute, we wish to take just a few minutes to do that, especially in connection with innovation in energy science and technology. So we will very briefly discuss the early days of the Stevens family of innovators and of the institute they founded. We'll then transition to discussing how this legacy is playing out on a daily basis today in education and research. We re recently celebrated at Stevens the 140th anniversary, um, being found, Stevens being founded in 1870. When we think back on those times, a number of innovations which significantly contribute to our lives today were either just newly discovered or not yet discovered. So for example, the incandescent light bulb was not yet commercialized. That was to come in 1878 by the wizard of Menlo Park, Thomas Edison. The first commercial electrical power plant in the US would not appear for 12 more years. The telephone had not been invented. The first commercial oil well in the US was drilled only 11 years earlier. The first transatlantic cable, telegraph cable, had been laid only four years earlier. And not surprisingly, there were no standardized time zones in the US. So kind of in summary, in 1870 United States, the medium to long distance communication could be considered rudimentary. The energy supply was at a point of transition. Deeper energy sources would, would be needed to move to the next phase of industrialization. In fact, it's very interesting, 1870 is at a crossroads. If you look at a graph of principal fuel sources in the US, you see wood declining and coal about to take off. And then petroleum a few decades later as the automobiles mass produced then taking over as well. So 1870, right in the middle of that transitional period of energy. Third, by inference, science-based engineering to advance technology would be critical for progress to the next level. And fourth, as a consequence, a steady supply of technology innovators would be needed to take the science-based engineering approach into society to enable progress. So realizing this need, the Stevens family, through a generous endowment of property and finances of Edwin A. Stevens, for whom this building is named, the youngest Stevens of Colonel, the youngest son of Colonel John Stevens, founded the Stevens Institute of Technology here in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1870. And the first catalog had this reading right at the very front. It was determined, as has been stated, to create a school of mechanical engineering. And as this was to be of a high educational order and to involve a general and not a merely industrial training, it was thought best in memory also of its munificent founder to call the new school the Stevens Institute of Technology. And there you see Edwin A. Stevens, the munificent founder of Stevens. OK, so the roots of innovation at Stevens run deeply in the Stevens family. Going back to Edwin's father, the patriarch, Colonel John Stevens, who was born in 1749 and trained as a lawyer. But he achieved success and acclaim in many fields, including in business, public service as the treasurer of New Jersey in the colonial era. Um, but achieved he. Uh, and also, he, he made significant achievements in technology, especially in power generation and transportation. So I'd like to, rather than go through a litany of his accomplishments, just focus on one 
from the area of steam power generation. So in the late 1700s, Colonel John was focusing on a new steamboat concept to use as a ferry for the harbors and rivers surrounding New York City. And in realizing this concept, he produced a design for the steam engine boiler, which you see in the figure there, which immediately addressed the significant problems of steam power, namely safety, efficiency, and performance. So his concept involved dividing up the boiler from being a single container into a number of sections in the form of dozens of two-inch uh, diameter copper tubes that you can see um, running along the length of the boiler there. Um, and so water would enter the tubes and the fire was outside the tubes. So immediately safety was improved due to greater strength of the smaller diameter and the lower volume of water that was contained. The improved strength permitted higher pressure operation, which improved efficiency and performance. And a key here would be obvious to most any of our undergrads in engineering that all of that additional surface area promoted heat transfer in the system. So this elegant and yet straightforward approach was patented with the help of one of Colonel's Colonel John's other sons, John Cox Stevens, who you see there, in 1803 in the US and in 1805 in England. And here you see the 1805 patent document. And the development early on, so this we're talking the turn of the uh, century there, was called by H.W. Dickinson in his 2011 book, A Surprising Anticipation of Subsequent Development. So this anticipation, this legacy, can be appreciated by considering the significant work that appeared afterward. Ultimately, patents for multi-tube boilers that built on this concept appeared in France in 1828 and England in 1829. And then more than 60 years later, the Americans Babcock and Wilcox obtained a patent for a boiler variant that launched them into a successful steam generation, generation business made possible by the multi-tube boiler. Modern steam turbines, which closely reflect the legacy of Colonel John, have water tube boilers. More than half the energy produced in the world today comes from water tube boilers. Stevens' innovation was evident early on in the new institute as well. In the late 19th century, the technical education movement called for a greater incorporation of the scientific basis of technology and a hands-on approach. Stevens chose to emphasize hands-on exper experiences in fundamental phenomena, labs involving operation and testing of practical systems, capstone projects by student teams, and exposure to innovation and entrepreneurship through projects with outside industry involvement. These are all things we do today. These are things that we value today at Stevens, and they form a vital part of our curriculum. The photo at the left shows the physical laboratory, which was actually located behind that wall in this building, in the original building of the institute. In this and other labs, students performed hands-on measurements on equipment replicated from high-impact publications of science and engineering. Two of these setups used to characterize the behavior of steam um, and their critical thermophysical parameters for steam power are shown uh, there as well. The list at the right is a list from the 1878 catalog on the courses, it says cor order of exercises, sorry, in experimental mechanics, the course on experimental mechanics. So these are the experiments that they did in that class, in that course. At Stevens today, the systems lab in mechanical and chemical engineering and in other majors, they follow a very similar approach, performing experiments relevant to real world applications in industry. The founding faculty of Stevens were active in not only teaching and creating a new curriculum in the early days, but were actively published, publishing in scholarly journals. And there's just a little list there at the right that you see of a few of those publications um, but each of these have the, the energy theme, where you see um, discussion of hydrocarbon fuels, solar science, hydrogen chemistry, 
and of course steam power. To briefly highlight two other contributions of um, early faculty in the energy area, um, Stevens were involved, faculty were involved in early innovation of coal-based fuels. In 1918, researchers here were the first to implement anthracite coal in steam engines. Uh, anthracite was the first, uh, was the most, uh, is the highest energy content form of coal and had just been discovered 20 years prior. Uh, a second area of um, involvement was by Professor Coleman Sellers, who you see in the back right hand of that photo as part of a prestigious international uh, commission to decide on the appropriate technology to be used at Niagara Falls. The, the um, chairman of that committee is the formidable Lord Kelvin seated in the center of the group there. And they, so they chose the energy technology, power generation technology, that finally came on stream in 1896. In, at Stevens today, once we fast forward to um, the current situation, the early innovation and commitment of the Stevens family and the Institute faculty have borne fruit as we consider just a partial list of accomplishments uh, of what you see there. And what is of particular note are the items that truly convey the societal impact that the founders sought. And I won't go through uh, the list, but what you can see is that the Institute is steadily supplying talented technology and technology innovators to society. And it is doing it cost effectively. Oops, sorry. So as a small school, we choose to focus uh, research efforts in just a few key thematic areas that we're going to go into as the next uh, part of this presentation. Uh, the, th the three thrusts you see labeled there are listed down at the bottom. I'm going to cover the first two just uh, in highlight, and then I'll turn over the presentation to Professor Fisher uh, to present nanotechnology and the multi-scale systems area. So the first uh, thrust is in the area of secure systems. Uh, which covers security in, maritime, in the maritime domain and in information and communications technology. Um, the port security theme is a natural topic of research given Stephen's legacy in maritime engineering and transportation. And the, na the National Center for Secure and Resilient Maritime Commerce, which is the focal point of the activity, is sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. In systems engineering and, in and enterprise management, um, that uh, group here provides graduate education and conducts doctoral research to address the complex problems facing society through the holistic uh, process involved in the systems engineering approach. The Systems Engineering Research Center is one of only 14 university-affiliated research centers, or UARCs, that are sponsored by the Department of Defense. It was founded in 2007 as a collaboration of 20 universities with Stevens as the lead. Thank you, Ron. The third research thrust of Stevens that I'd like to spend a little bit more time talking about today is nanotechnology and multi-scale systems. The vision of this theme, of this uh, research thrust, is to enable systems level integration and implementation over a broad spectrum of length scales, cutting across engineering sciences and life sciences disciplines with nanotechnology as, you, as a key driver. As you can see, there are over 33 affiliated faculty whose research wholly or in part is associated with this research thrust. And funding for these external projects comes from various sources, including the National Science Foundation, DARPA, the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and NASA. Currently on campus, there are over 70 externally funded research projects in the nanotechnology and multi-scale system. If you had a chance to visit the research colloquium yesterday, you would have seen 30 plus undergraduate projects who were related with nanotechnology research. One of the key areas of interdisciplinary research in this thrust is nanomaterials and nano-enabled systems. And here I've highlighted just a few examples of the innovative work that Stevens faculty are doing in this area. In the upper left hand corner, you see the work of Professor Changwon Choi in mechanical engineering who is developing new techniques to be able to create 
nanopatterned superhydrophobic surfaces. Surfaces that are superhydrophobic are surfaces that are resistant to rusting. And Professor Choi has received significant funding from the Office of Naval Research to investigate rust uh, corrosion resistant surfaces. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see um, the work of Professor Shuskavili in the Chemistry, Chemical, Biology, and Biomedical Engineering Department, whose international expertise is in self assembled polymers in solution and on surfaces. In the lower left hand corner, is the, is the group of professors Meng, Crystallatus, and Corfiatis in the Center for Environmental Systems who have developed and pioneered techniques to use nano-sized titanium dioxide to absorb uh, heavy metals and other impur uh, impurities uh, from water. In the lower right-hand side, you'll see the hybrid extrusion electrospinning process developed in the lab of Professor Dohan Kalyan and the Highly Filled Materials Institute in Chemical Engineering. A second major re research theme in the nanotechnology and multi-scale systems is the nanobio interface. And I've listed just a few of the faculty from a wide variety of departments who are contributing their various expertise into the, in, in this research thrust. For example, one project that's been funded by the National Science Foundation is to develop differential or nanostructured surfaces which provide differential cell adhesion. These would be surfaces ideal for implant materials where healthy cells would be able to adhere to the surface while bacteria and other, um, and other cells uh, would not be able to stick to the surface so that you could get better implant performance. The third area that I'd like to talk about is research and this thrust in energy. And here I've highlighted just a few examples. Uh, the first is in solar photovoltaics where a, the, an interdisciplinary group of faculty with Professor Okora, Professor Besser, myself, and Professor Shuskavili are looking to develop multifunctional nanocomposite films with both anti-reflective properties as well as the capability to enhance the quantum efficiency of these photovoltaic devices. The enhancement in quantum efficiency could be captured by using specialized nanoparticles which would be able to convert the energetic photons in UV and not near UV radiation or levels to energies which correspond to the maximum quantum efficiency of the solar device. The, approach, the approaches that we're investigating use layer by layer technology and a layer by layer approach, which we are interested in because it could be technology potentially environmentally friendly and potentially scalable. And we're pursuing these ideas. With, uh, with industry sponsors and industry uh, collaborators. The second area is energy harvesting and energy scavenging. Here the idea is to convert ambient energy in, uh, in a given environment to create low levels of electrical energy which could be useful for different applications. One potential application of this technology would be to locally power the individual nodes of a sensor network. This, sens this sensor network could be used in Homeland Security or in national infrastructure. For example, to monitor the structural health of uh, critical civil infrastructure such as bridges and roads. In this area, I've highlighted a couple of work, uh, a few work that's been done, that is being done in mechanical engineering. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see multifunctional nanowires and nanofibers. Uh, PZT is the uh, gold standard of piezoelectric materials and Professor Yang Shi and his students have patented a way to make PZT nanofibers which could have uh, very innovative applications in, uh, as nano and multi, uh, micro scale um, energy harvesting uh, uh, transduction mechanisms. In the lower left hand corner is work of myself with Professors Prasad and Capillary looking at developing new techniques for ambient vibration energy harvesting and in addition develop, we're pursuing techniques which can make an autonomous system where we would be able to automatically tune the resonance of our device to match the environmental source frequency. In the lower right hand corner is an energy harvesting project uh, with a number of collaborators in mechanical engineering led by Professors Manichuri and Pojaraju looking at using energy harvesting from energetic materials. The third work of, uh, in the energy theme um, in the nano and multi-scale um, research for us at Stevens is graphene for energy applications. Okay. Graphene was, uh, uh, research in graphene led to the two, 2010 Nobel Prize. And there's a number of different faculty and different research projects who are doing very leading edge, very innovative work in this area. For example, on the lower left hand corner of the screen, 
um, is from a recent paper from professors Yang in mechanical engineering, Professor Stefan Strauff and his students in physics, investigating the uh, fundamental opto optoelectrical properties of graphene. In the upper right hand corner is work being done in Professor Yang's group in mechanical engineering, pursuing novel ways to do nanomanufacturing to create 3D graphene carbon nanotube multi stack architectures for portable power systems. Here, the idea of using carbon nanotube spacers to separate the individual layers of graphene could prevent agglomeration of graphene sheets and lead to increased surface area, which could lead to enhanced supercapacitor performance. In the lower right-hand corner is the work from Professor Woolley's group in the chemical engineering and material, uh, um, material science departments, uh, where they were the first group to use uh, inkjet printing and thermal reduction of graphene uh, to create graphene oxide. Okay, this technique as a patent pending. Okay. I did want to touch on some of the research that's being done outside of the nano and multi-scale system work, but that's still related to energy. And there are some great examples of that in the Davidson Laboratory. On the left is Seahorse Power LLC, which is a new Stevens uh, startup company, which is developing offshore energy technology, um, core technologies to be able to harness energy uh, from the ocean. Their patented design is based on shoaling wave energy. This approach increases the amplitude of ex existing waves um, and increases the amplitude of the bobbing of the device and has led to a 400% increase in the energy production. On the right hand side is perhaps one of the newest projects in the School of Engineering, uh, which is the offshore wind energy project funded by the Department of Energy. Here, Professor Tom Harrington and colleagues are looking at developing LIDAR techniques to be able to acquire 3D um, maps of offshore wind speeds, which would be useful for optimizing offshore wind uh, turbine performance. Okay. So in conclusion, the legacy of Stevens has been driving innovation. We have seen this in the founders, and we hope that we can continue this excellent tradition today. There are a number of uh, educational projects and educational initiatives which we are developing to try to increase and facilitate innovation, entrepreneurship within our undergraduate students. Some of these projects would include uh, an NSF GK12 funded project where we are working with PhD students who are working, uh, spending 10 hours a week working in local high schools to excite the student, those students about science and engineering while at the same time helping our PhD students become better communicators of their technical research. There is also a project sponsored by the National Science Foundation where Stevens and the Center for Innovation and Engineering and Science Education are training middle school teachers, over 400 middle school teachers in the next five years to be more competent and more tech, um, and, and to have better fundamentals in, science, in, in the science courses so that they can transfer that, that knowledge to their students. So in the end, um, we see Stevens as a campus, as a testbed, as an incubator for innovation, uh, both in education and in energy. Thank you.